Good afternoon. I hope you've been, been enjoying the conference as much as I have. It's taken me on a lot of uh, trips down memory lane, uh, kind of reminiscing about experiences, learning the hard way for the most part. Um, I didn't come from a missionary family. Uh, I didn't have experience with uh, people that thought about, talked about the subjects we talk about today at any point before being involved with the Mayangna Indians. Um, had very brief exposure uh, to some mainly Beechy Amish or conservative Mennonite missions in Central America before I, I was in contact with this people group. And um, basically knew that if we were going to work within a closed indigenous territory among a people group with a distinct language and their own identity, then the one thing I was going to uh, have to do was basically nothing I had seen. Or I should say, everything I had seen I was not going to do. <laughs> um, so that was uh, pretty much starting with a blank slate. Don't know what to do, but we're not going to do what we've seen. And um, from there, uh, the Lord has led, protected, probably reprimanded many a time, and uh, still in contact with them, still working with them, still trying to help, although somewhat remotely. Um, as it relates to sustainable agriculture, in particular, or community development subjects, I never did anything particularly in, in an intentional manner. It was always kind of a byproduct of the relationship with the people. So when you're with the people, you live with them, you walk the trails with them, you plant rice with a stick with them, day in, day out, you carry firewood back to the house with them. After that umpteenth trip with 150 pounds of firewood on your back for half an hour, you think, what if we made the stove so that it would cook a little bit better, or what if we made it so that we could cook more things, because just boiling bananas seems like a lot of work for that firewood just to boil bananas. Maybe we could once in a while bake something. Anyway, a lot of, a lot of things just came out of that, just living with the people. Um, planting, do we really have to slash and burn everything? You know, is there any way we could incorporate some organic matter in the soil while we're at it? Uh, that type of question would come up, and um, as I gained in relationship with the people and fluency in the language, then I would proposed to a good friend of mine that I worked with. My primary focus was translation, so I'm not really talking about translation, but that's what we were really doing the whole time, and the rest of the time we're living. And living is where sustainable agriculture and community development type projects came in. There's no medicine available, so we start a community pharmacy throughout the territory of about 18 communities. We pick certain communities which we can work in. Uh, somebody I meet on a train gives me $300. I go to the black market in Managua. We buy medicine. We start a community pharmacy. Um, and this type of thing, very organic, not zero fundraising. Um, I don't know how to fundraise. I take my hat off to all of you who do. Um, pretty much just living with the people on a shoestring. And um, translation was our work, so everything else was just doing things. Um, did a lot of different projects in terms of kind of endeavoring to learn with them a way to improve what they were already doing. Um, worked with marketing, worked with trying to market different common crops that everybody knew how to grow. Uh, ran into the whole situation with the racist environment in the commercial sphere of the neighboring Spanish communities where our main market was. Um, basically failed in that, tried to market products farther out, like with starting to grow coffee, cacao, things like that that we could market across the country get to where we were people too, that side of the country. And um, anyway, worked with a lot of different things like that. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about Nicaragua. I don't know if we can, let's see, how do I do this? Just a moment.
Okay. So I don't have a pointer, but if you look in the top, there's a red circle drawn on the map. That's approximately where the majority of the Mayangna people are. It's a couple hundred square kilometers of rainforest. Um, was, maybe still is, the last large remaining tract of rainforest outside of the Amazon basin in the Americas. Um, the Bolsa Was Biosphere Reserve, and there are several major river systems in it, and they all flow out from the center of it. So there are a lot of geographical divides to work with the Mayangna people. One side of the mountains is a bit of a different dialect and a different group from the other side, and the rivers are all flowing away from each other. So transportation, communication between the different communities, different regions, is, is quite complicated. Um, traditionally, you have to basically go around the whole other side of the country and then back in again in order to get to the other territory. So in the early days of moving books and Bibles and things like that, got to know the rivers a lot, balsa raft, dugout canoe, on foot. Sometimes you take a month at a time between getting out to a town with a phone or something like that. Um, logistical challenge, working within the people group, is definitely transportation is one of them. Um, there are a number of access roads now to the different areas, but I'm going to focus on the Mayangna territory number one, Mayangna Saunias, which is where I lived and worked mostly where my wife is from. It's kind of the central dialect, so for translation that was, seemed like the most reasonable place to work, the largest population. Um, it was around 1,200, let's see, I think it was around, I, I won't say that, I don't remember the, all the numbers. It was a very large territory. It took many days to walk across it, put it that way. Most of it was impenetrable rainforest, and um, as you can see, the concentration of villages, towns, is right in the middle on four major rivers, and then out to either direction, both west and east, um, basically you have no villages represented. So. The largest population center is right smack in the middle, thanks to the Moravians who came in about 1930s and tried to move all of the family clans that lived and spread out across the rivers, tried to move them in one place for church and school. So it's kind of a Mayangna city with different neighborhoods that are from different clans and different dialect groups and so on. Um, then these are more organic clan structure villages on these other rivers. Um, these red lines here, I tried to estimate, roughly draw, conflict zones. So at this point, they're completely surrounded. This historic town is, is gone. It's taken by the Spanish school, church, everything. Um, this whole area now is in conflict, armed conflict. Um, they're pretty much stuck in the center with um, small parcels of land. Some of the villages still have access to their own plantings. Uh, the village that my wife is from, where the leadership was recently imprisoned with life sentences, they have basically no, um, no access to their own plantings. Um, right across from Suniwas, this village here, on this side of the river, the Lord made it possible to have a a farm that's outside of the territory, which we have, and that's been where we've done a lot of experimentation in the last years. As the conflict intensified for the land, also the complications within the territorial government structure became more and more difficult, and so it seemed like the most reasonable thing was work from outside the territory. Um, Nicaragua has tremendous laws. I think they rival any European country for detailing everything. Uh, they have tremendous plans. You could go to any office and you could find land use plans. You could find, you know, municipal zones, zoning, um, every detail, how your structure should be. Uh, 
If you wanted to make a well, you could spend $5,000 trying to fulfill all the legal requirements uh, with geological surveys and geologists and so on. Uh, very structured, very organized, very bureaucratic, but nothing gets implemented. So, a couple of pictures from yesteryear. That's Arabica coffee growing at 130 meters. We traded uh, shade and rainforest cool breezes for elevation and found we could produce export quality specialty grade coffee. A um, few cattle there. Plantains, kind of a staple crop. It was a cash crop that was pretty good until the road got improved a lot recently. And a bunch of the road going back to the eastern part of the country is paved now. And so now the large plantations, commercial, industrial type plantations from the west now can ship truckloads of bananas in and pretty well wiped out the market. Um, just a little view of kind of the area on, on your left, on my right, sorry, on your right, if I can hit the right button. Anyway, um, is pretty much what you'd expect for preparation for planting, going into high bush, chopping it out. Um, depending upon what you'd be planting, you would slash and burn it, you know, burn it too, or you would just chop it like that if you're planting bananas and things like that, and um, select the trees that you'd leave for some shade. Uh, left, typical, that's a farm. Doesn't might not look like it to you, but uh, to the to the eye of the person there, there are all different varieties of bananas, and uh, probably there was corn raised within the last eight months during its season, etc. Yeah, the bush grows back instantly, almost. I mean, two weeks and you have you have something growing there. Small streams, fishing, gathering. Um, that with some boiled bananas would be a, a fine meal and um, typical diet from longer ago. This would be another image of a farm. Um, coconuts, plantains, there's cacao out there. Farther in the distance there's um, pejivaya, a palm nut, um, another staple. Yucca, malanga, kikiski, all the different tubers that grow in the tropics are common. I uh, committed a, probably a felony um, by introducing turmeric. It now is all over. Um, people use it as a seasoning and it's a healthful plant. Ginger pretty much grows about wild. Um, but you can grow everything. It can be practically like the Garden of Eden, but if you never know when the next raid's going to be, if you don't know if you're going to return back from your farm, if you have to gather all the men of the village to go and cut bananas, then it's, it's kind of over for the lifestyle. Traditionally, the women, the children would do a lot of the gathering. Men would do a lot of hunting, sometimes migrant work. The cash currency for the people has always been gold. Um, gold panning. Um, more recently, uh, they've moved to um, moved to more shaft mining in there. Gotten a little bit more technical. They found a number of different veins, and a lot of the most recent massacres have been for control of those um, resources. Um, I could show you a little bit about uh, artisan mining in Nicaragua, but maybe that's not the main purpose. I don't know if anybody's really interested in supporting a project with artisan mining. Um, what do we do now? Where do we go from here? We know how to grow things. Um, we have pursued markets and found that we had marketable products. But who wants to plant cacao? take care of those trees for four years till you get your first 
crop that really starts to give you something back with a lifespan of maybe 20, 30 years if you maintain it properly, just to have next year the Spanish group come in and take your land. I mean, even bananas for us, eight, ten months. Um, yucca, six months, you barely have anything, eight months. Uh, about any crop that we rely on, uh, we need some stability. Uh, beans, very short season crops like that, are hard to grow because we don't have much dry season. Uh, rains 200 plus inches a year normally. Uh, dry season, it will rain some throughout often, once or twice a week, and so you can easily have a failure with, with crops that rely on a long dry period to harvest. Um, the challenges with organizational structure within the communities, how am I on time? A few minutes yet? Okay. I'm, uh, there are many. Communities are very divided. The one structure that was pretty intact when I first started working with the people uh, 20 years ago was the Moravian Church in this region. Some other regions it would have been the Catholic Church. And um, kind of the whole village radiated out from there. Uh, the church was the central institution. Uh, there were work days where everybody went to work on the church's farm to support it. Uh, there were festivals everybody participated in, harvest festivals and so on. Uh, and it pr provided kind of a nucleus for the social development in the community. You had to relate to the Moravian leadership in that community if you were going to do anything. And we came in underneath them, uh, related to them directly. We didn't plant a denominational flag and work, worked hand in hand with them initially. And um, so every community is divided with people that will hardly talk to each other because of this division in the church. Um, other churches have come in. There are little evangelical churches. There are home churches. A lot of things have changed. This building here is what we call the Bible house that we built outside the territory, just outside of it on the farm. And um, we could use it for small home churches or families that wanted to get together, have a Bible study, be together for two or three days, um, worship God together. And so we had different activities related to that. At this point, as you can see, it's, uh, it's still there, but no people. So they are now in Honduras and are working with Bible translation in Honduras. Um, so that, yeah, that building, he was working with a group of families spread out across the territory, different, really family clans, which had decided to try to worship God in their own family and uh, follow the Bible. And that was uh, what that building was used for. 